another season the first draft is underway Jalen Carter too quick too powerful Tags to that's a touchdown that is a bad man oh no 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 I'm not maybe the best player in the sport watch out for Mr. Robinson fifth touchdown pass for CJ Stroud Jackson Smith and Jigbo arguably the top receiver in the country if you didn't know the name Will Levis before tonight you know it now Richardson late throws a defender out of bounds he is a highlight reel waiting to happen every time he touches the football Well, if that doesn't get you excited, I know what will as we say hello and welcome back to First Draft. We made it to week two, which means we were good enough in week one to be ba brought back from where I'm Field Yates, and you're going to see two gentlemen on my screen in just a matter of moments. They are Todd McShay and, of course, Mel Kuyper Jr. And, Mel, you are always in the spotlight as it pertains to the NFL Draft. But your Mach 1.0 is out today. Be honest, how long have you been looking forward to publishing your first Mock Draft of the year? Probably for about 24 hours, because that's what you really <laughs> look at and you say, let's oh, start. Stop no, it's the calls no. you make. Uh, no, it's, I'm, I'm serious. There's the calls you make are prior to that. And then you sit there and you try to debate. You look at the needs. You try to, it's a puzzle. And you take it seriously, which I do each one. And the, you, know, you try to get some right, but you really, you don't have the combine numbers yet. Senior Bowl's coming up. All those things still have to happen, but it's fun to do. It's a great exercise. I didn't project any trades. McShay may have in his Mach 1. I didn't. Uh, I didn't see any to make. I didn't want to force it uh, and distort the whole first round. I wanted to get some names in there that maybe some other people don't have. And I don't check every Mach first. I check McShay's and that's it once a while because we did the show a couple weeks ago on that. Other than that, you just go by what you feel, what you see, what you hear. Put it all together and you come up with Mach 1.0. So I know McShay's going to have a lot of problems with it. Fire away, my friend. The only thing I'll say is, you know Chicago's sitting at one, right? And every, every right. team that needs a quarterback wants to get to that number one spot. Yeah. You didn't move out of there. Do you think Chicago's not going to trade out of that number one spot? Here's the thing, Todd. I don't know who they're going to do it with, number one. And I don't know if somebody's going to offer them enough to entice them to move out for quarterbacks. And I couldn't build a consensus. And you make a lot of calls to your friends in the NFL – I have been in 45 years, and you make your calls, and I couldn't build any consensus. Some guys really like one, but the other guy doesn't like it. I, nobody was on the same page, and I couldn't get that. And I don't think this is a good draft. I, think it's, I, I have never really said that that much over drafts because I know there's always going to be good players out there. I had trouble with a top 150 ratings board. Wow. It's, it's just not a good draft on paper. Does that not mean that some of these guys that we think aren't as good as maybe they will be? And we underrate them? Sure there will be. Uh, so, but on, on paper, this does not look like a good draft. Some NFL teams echoed that to me. But in terms of, of the mock draft, uh, in terms of the first pick, Todd, Detroit, you think about it, they're not taking a quarterback, okay? Indianapolis is. Seattle could, okay? And you get to Vegas, they could. Who's who are you going to have moving up? Mm. You know, Detroit's going with golf. Maybe they look at quarterback, maybe second, field, third, fourth. Field. This is the part I love. Yeah. I, I so love me, the fact that Will Levis is your number one, one quarterback, right? No, no, I'm I, I'm talking to Correct. field right now. I, I'm here. I'm number one too. quarterback yeah. is who? Yeah, oh, good. Will Levis is your number one quarterback. Yeah. The vast majority yeah. of people I talk to in the league is Bry Bryce Young's there of QB one. But you put C.J. Stroud at the number one quarterback spot. That was – like when I, I printed out this paper and I'm looking at I was – wait, what? <laughs> C.J. Stroud's don't, the don't number one quarterback yet. for don't, Mel? Don't give it all up yet, Tom. Okay. We got, we're going we're gonna to unveil these first yeah. five picks yeah. one by one. Yeah. See, this is the beauty and of the show. always jumps the gun for no, you. No, no, I, but that's the passion. That's the beauty of the show is the two of you, we can, we can put you anytime, anyplace, anywhere, and just mention a draft prospect, and it would turn into like a 90-minute back and forth between the two of you about all the pros and cons and mock drafts and quarterback that's rankings fact. and everything else. It's why we love first draft. And just a reminder for those that maybe are jumping aboard this week and weren't around with us last week, every week, you can watch us every week here Wednesdays, 1 p.m. Eastern time on YouTube, Twitter, wherever you like to watch your various streams. And, of course, the audio version for those that like the podcast, wherever you get your podcast. We are going to dive into Mel Kuyper Jr.'s first five picks of his mock draft. It's now available on ESPN+. And Todd introduced a question that we are going to dive into even more specifically in a future podcast for, like, 
a full subject or maybe even a full show. It's what do you do if you're Ryan Poles and you're the Bears general manager right now and you have that number one pick, which not every year, but many years is reserved for a quarterback. And you've got Justin Fields. You do not need a quarterback. So let's go ahead and dive in to these first five picks. And because there were no trades in this mock draft, uh, Amel, you had to give the Bears somebody. Where did you start with Chicago going number one overall? Yeah, I mean, Todd talks about the quarterbacks like they're super elite. I didn't find that, and, and I didn't find a consensus. So this notion that Bryce Young at 5'11", 190 is going to be a guy you're going to give up a, a lot of picks to go up and get, I didn't see that, and I didn't hear that. So I said, okay, if you're stuck at number one, you got to make a pick. You need a defensive lineman. That was a group that obviously needs an influx, not just one, but probably three defensive linemen. And I went with Jalen Carter, number one player on my big board, and a guy who was a disruptor along the interior. When he got healthy after that so September injuries, he was a guy that was playing to the level of the 2021 season when everybody said he was the best player on that talent-laden Georgia Bulldog defense. So I think they want to come out of this draft with Jalen Carter. Uh, Will Anderson Jr. certainly would make sense as well, whether it's interior or outside pass rusher. Uh, my thing is, who's going to move up and give them enough to move down? Could it be the Colts? If the Colts isolate on one quarterback that they have to have above the others? And I put C.J. Stroud at two for a reason because I didn't find any consensus on the other guys as well. We'll get to him in a minute. But if you look at, at Jalen Carter, I thought Will Anderson Jr. was not as dominant this year as he was in 2021. I didn't see the bend of a Miles Garrett or a Von Miller, the explosiveness of those two and some of the other great pass rushers. I didn't see a Nick Bosa. I didn't yeah. see an Aiden Hutchinson there. So to me, Will Anderson Jr. and Jalen Carter, I went with Carter there for that reason. Need plus the great player along the interior. Justin Fields, to me, you don't trade that pick, okay, and say, okay, or trade Fields and say, I'm going to draft Young. People say, trade Fields, draft Young. I'm not buying into that. Justin Fields, to me, is going to be a great quarterback in this league. He's already shown signs of that and the kind of potential he has. Surround him by better players. Justin Fields can take off for you and be a heck of a quarterback. So build the defense. Hope you can. Hey, I'd love, Todd, for Houston at two to offer me something to go to one. And then I could move to two and yes. still get Jalen Carter. Then I could see how things work and maybe go from two to four to still get Carter or Anderson. So you could maneuver in a way and still get the great or the potentially great defensive lineman and get off of that first pick. But my thing is, is Houston going to give you enough to do it? Are they going to be wanting to do it or just sit at two? I think it's going to be fun to see how this all plays out. I don't think they're going to sit at two. I, I mean, I, I think they're going to do everything they can, and I think the Colts are going to be the driving reason. The Colts are, like, they, they're done with dealing with veteran quarterbacks who come in and just don't fit the bill. Mm. They have a great roster. They do. A, a great roster on both sides of the ball. They have a run game. They have a solid defense. They need to get that quarterback. And so why wouldn't you pick from four to one, move up, whatever it takes. Like, next year's two, next year's one. Go get that guy. I would make it Bryce Young. Maybe it's C.J. Stroud for you or Will Levis, whatever you want to say. But my point is, I think that number one pick is going to be worth a lot. Mm. And I think the, the Bears have to sit there and decide, all right, are we comfortable? Do we have our quarterback? And if not, then, then let's draft one. If not, move back two spots and we'll get Jalen Carter. We'll get Will Anderson. You know, I want to look back to last year, and I know it's very different circumstances, but Ryan Poles, in his first draft as the Bears GM last year, became the GM that around the NFL on day two and day three turned one pick into like eight. The Bears had no picks last year. They had yep. like 11 guys they drafted. Like he is going to build this team through the draft. I'm sure volume will be his friend. No trades, though, so the Bears stay at one. Let's go to pick two, Mel. And number two, a quarterback off the board of the Houston Texans. Who is it? Well, my pick would be Will Levis. He's my number. He's my QB one. Uh, Todd's has Bryce Young. I went with C.J. Stratt. Who, who's the quarterback that I saw and heard the least criticism of? Mm. Okay, and it was C.J. Stroud. C.J. Stroud, the last two years, tremendous touchdown interception ratio. He showed in the Georgia game how he could move around and use those legs. Uh, he doesn't throw interceptions. He throws at with accuracy to all levels. Uh, this is a guy who is a competitor. Uh, you know, you think about the talent around him. Was a lot of pitch and catch, not dealing with adversity. I get all that but in the Georgia game he had to deal with that I think that game made him right put him into discussion to be QB1 with some people so that's why I did it uh, because of Bryce Young's size and Will Levis with a year he had to for whatever reason people want to take that and make that the major part of their evaluation is a year when he was beat up and he had nothing around him 
Okay, if you want to go that route, fine. That's your opinion, go do it. So that's why I didn't feel Levis because of some of the criticism I heard or negativity would be that guy. Young size, everybody said was a major factor in why they could not take him or feel comfortable taking him that high. It's never happened in the history of the NFL draft, Todd. So that's why Stroud, you want to say the safest based on what I heard, that's probably, the, that was the logic I used to make him the second pick overall. Isn't it like you and I have always talked about one game can't make or break a quarterback, right? Mm -hmm. But my goodness, that game against Georgia and, and in a loss showed us everything that we were looking for, right? For I mean, for two years we were saying, just use your mobility, like, just take take it over, right? And that's what he did. And that that game was mm -hmm. special. And if that's the, the if you're a head coach in the league, a general manager, and you've been working on your team. And now you're just just coming into the college evaluation. You plug in that game. You're like, that's my guy, mm. right? He was tremendous in that game. And I know that uh, obviously, as you guys both just said, one game does not make or break a college quarterback. But I do feel like, and maybe this is low hanging fruit because they played quarterback at the same school. But the narrative changed around Justin Fields after his game against Clemson in the college football playoff when he had six touchdown passes, yes, and all those exactly. other people are saying. Have we overthought it? Like, should he be in the same conversation as his counterpart in exactly, that game? Exactly, Fields. Yeah, so things can be influenced by just a small sample size. Let's go to pick three, Mel. And a year ago, we might have thought that Will Anderson was the first pick off the board. Instead, he goes three to Arizona. What are they getting in Will Anderson? Great worker, a tremendous passion for the game, never quits on a play, whether it's a run, whether it's going after the quarterback, coverage sacks, he's going to get after it. And he's going to make that offensive tackle work and concentrate and focus for the entire game. Because if that offensive tackle takes a play or two off and is distracted by whatever, he's going to beat you. And my thing is against NFL bookends, who are the best in the world, Okay, without the explosiveness, without the bend of a Miles Garrett or a Von Miller, can he take what he did, say, in 2021 when he was unblockable, and this year more blockable because his, his numbers and his overall dominance diminished a little bit? Can he take his game, Todd, with the way it is to the next level and be a 12 to 15 sack a year, guys? That's what you're looking for, okay? Mm -hmm. That's what you want him to be. Can he be that guy against the best in the world at offensive tackle? That's going to be interesting to watch to see how his career unfolds. But for Arizona, that's what they need to get him at three. A guy that, as you said, Field, going into this year, you said it's a lock. I don't care who the quarterbacks are. You can't pass him up. But this year, you didn't see the Bosa, Nick Bosa, the Miles Garrett, Joey Bosa, Von Miller. Uh, you didn't see that this year from, from Will Anderson Jr., and that's why I think he could drop to that third spot and still be a guy that you have to wonder, is he a 6, 7, 8, 9 sack guy, or is he that 12 to 15, 18 sack guy? Uh, that remains to be seen. I, listen, I, I love the sacks, but the, the pressures to me, like 50-plus pressures, he was up there with everybody else in the country. And, and you got to understand, there were uh, chip blocks, tight ends hanging in, shifting, your, shifting everything in your blocking scheme to make sure that 31 didn't get home. And he still was up there with the number one guys with top pressures in the league, in, in all of college football. And yes, I, I get it. He didn't get home. And there were a few times on tape, and I studied it, where it's like, finish. And he didn't finish. But... He was always disrupting. And Nick Saban always talks about that. Like, uh, sacks are great, but a disruption is more important when you get it consistently. And that's what he provided. And th that's why I love him. And like you, like you said, Mel, this guy loves the game. He's a leader. And he's going to come in that locker room. And he's going to make everybody around him better. And if I just want a safe pick in the top five if I'm not drafting a quarterback. Mm -hmm. And that's what Will Anderson is to me. We'll see who the head coach and subsequent defensive coordinator is in Arizona. Could influence kind of how Will Anderson is used down in and down out, but he had an incredible college career that probably means he's headed for the top five. So, Mel, we go to pick four. Uh, Todd already told you how the Colts need to get a quarterback this year. You have him taking one. Who do you have? Bryce Young, and I think when you look at the Colts, whether it's Will Levis, Bryce Young, C.J. Stratton, it's going to be one of the three. You know that. Uh, you look at this team playing indoors, okay? 
You got Houston in division, indoors. Nice weather in Jacksonville, Tennessee, right? And you got Bryce Young without the incredible arm strength. He doesn't add the tremendous speed. He's only 5'10", 5'11", 185, 190. So in that dome, that lack of great arm strength, it's not going to be a big factor. You got perfect conditions. Like I said, the division allows that. So for me, when you look at that division overall, with Tennessee's question mark at quarterback, right? You got Houston's going to be looking at a quarterback. Certainly Indy will. Jacksonville has their franchise guy and Trevor, and there's no question the Colts are going that route. Which one of the three? I don't know. My guy's Levis. Todd's guy's Young. I think Stroud, I heard from a lot of people in the league. These three guys, it's a three-horse race, and that's what it boils down to. It's a three-horse race till the end of April. And, and right now, Todd, I don't know. I can easily say I don't know. I talk to a lot of people in the league. You do as well. I don't know. Every, if Bryce Young were, and I'm not, I don't care about the height. If he were had the frame to be know, 205 to 215, he doesn't have that frame. He's Can working he on it. I promise you that. Hold up physically. What's that, Todd? I said he's working on it. I, and I, I sat down and talked to him. Mm -hmm. and, and like the trainers and the, like the nutrition that he's working on. He wants to get up to 210 to have that, that frame that's going to hold up. And he, don't forget this. He took a punishment in the SEC. If, if you really go back and study his tape, there's no quarterback in the country, in my opinion, that took a bigger punishment than he did. And, yeah, he had a little shoulder, shoulder injury for, what, two weeks? But other than that, he, he hung in there. That's what, to me, like, he's the number one quarterback in this class because he has that toughness in addition to the, the ability to create. And I don't, with CJ, it was great to see in that one game, but I saw that poise and, and creativity and the ability to just work off platform in every single game for Bryce Young. And that, that's why he's, he's my guy. And, and if I'm the Colts, just to, just to go back to it, if I'm the Colts, I'm Chris Ballard, the, the GM, I'm, go, I'm going up to number one, and I'm going to get him because I, I have had enough. And as we talk about it often on this show, the Colts are sitting at pick four. The Bears have one of the first three picks ahead of them. It's unlikely the Bears think it's, it's virtually – certain the Bears won't take a quarterback in the first round. Maybe people will say, well, why not just sit there and wait? And we always remind people, just because we see a quarterback a certain way doesn't mean that a team sees him a certain mm -hmm. way. And while we may think the Colts should love Will Levis or Bryce Young, maybe they say we only like C.J. Stroud. He's the only one that is the apple of our eyes. So we're going to move on up. Sure. Yeah, a team that if it does move up for a quarterback – won't have to move up too far, too far because of their good fortune in the Russell Wilson trade as Seattle Seahawks. And Mel, Geno Smith's going to be their guy in 2023, according to the Seahawks themselves. But should they have an eye towards the future with their fifth overall pick, again, via the Russell Wilson trade? Yeah, I would. I would look at Will Levis here if he were still on the board, or this could be a trade-out opportunity. I didn't want to project trades here, but if that third quarterback is sitting there and Seattle says, okay, come up and get him. Come up and get him, whoever you are, and you want this guy, whether it's Vegas, Carolina, whoever it is, come up and get that guy. Will Levis, I talked about Bryce Young withstanding punishment. This guy withstood more punishment than anybody, in my opinion. He got pounded. He got, had no help from that offensive line. Ole block after Ole block. Come get my quarterback. Pound him into submit. He, he was destroyed at quarterback. His body was destroyed from the ankles to the toes to the shoulder. Everywhere in between. This kid is tough. And to get back out there and play, the offensive line being as bad as it was, uh, he didn't get any support at all. And he still hung in there and was with his team. He was with the team during the bowl game when he couldn't play. Yeah. Uh, okay. He didn't go prepare for a, a, the draft process. He, he wanted to be there with his guys. And I, and I brought up the play. that when the, the Emmanuel Forbes pick and then to come back out there and take him right down the field. To take the pounding he did, Todd, and still try to be out there and compete. Uh, he had no rushing touchdowns over their last eight games. Mm -hmm. He had two early. He's not over mm -hmm. the last, last year when he was healthy in 20. He had nine rushing touchdowns, 23 touchdown passes, led them to a 10-3 and three record. He completed a ton of passes against Georgia, was lights out against LSU, ran for over 100 yards. I mean, uh, you talk about the offense he played in, West Coast. The, he played for one coordinator, coordinator left to go to the Rams. Then the other coordinator steps in. Now the other coordinator's coming back. He was yep. at Penn State. He's going to be 20, we'll see, 23 right now, be 24 in June. Uh, he's been through an awful lot. And physically, adapting to different op offensive coordinators, different players around him. Uh, yeah, I, there's a lot to love about Will Levis in terms of the top five, top six of the draft. The, the turnovers were maddening. Some of the mistakes and his eyes dropping, frustrating. 
But there are two things that you got to know about him. One, when he goes out to Peyton Manning camp, who's the most talented quarterback there? Will Levis. Mm. And then when you talk to every single person on campus at Kentucky, I'm talking like the, the lunch lady and gentleman, every single person swears by this guy, his leadership, his character, what he's going to bring to an organization, the way he loves ball. It's hard not to bet on Will Levis, despite the fact the tape wasn't great. So that's why to me, like, we'll get to AR later, Anthony Richardson from Florida, because he's the most talented player in the draft. But when it comes to Will Levis, he's more advanced, but he is the most talented of the top three quarterbacks we're talking about from an arm strength and mobility standpoint. And he has that great character, but there's so much on tape that you get frustrated with. So that's why, to me, I know that you said it earlier, Mel, this draft class is not as good as the last couple of years. But this quarterback class is fascinating to me. It sure is. And the fact that we have three in the top five is a big change from where we were last year. We're just one. Kenny Pickett mm -hmm. went in the first round. And Malik Willis, who some in sort of draft Twitter thought could be a first round pick, dropped to the third round. So we're going to dive into this entire mock draft for those that are listening to this or watching it live uh, at 5 p.m. Eastern time on ESPN2. We'll be doing one of these Sports Center specials, which will also be available on ESPN+. Plus, If you want to see all 31, remember there is not 32, but just 31 picks this year because of the Dolphins uh, forfeiting a pick due to the Stephen Ross tampering situation. Uh, 31 picks, you can check it out on ESPN+, Plus or watch a little bit later on on ESPN2. Let's go from the mock draft to the wide receivers. And no wide receivers in the first five picks. Doesn't feel like there's a Devontae Smith or a Jamar Chase-type prospect in this year's class. But, Todd, why don't you start things off? Quinton Johnson seems to be one of the most well-regarded wide receivers in this year's class. He's a pterodactyl. I've said it before. I'll say it again. He's 6'4", over 220 pounds. His arm length is down to his ankles. And the best part about Quinton Johnson is – his after the catch ability. Mm -hmm. You know, most guys who are that height, that weight, they're just like late, late catch, back off a defender and go up and get it contested, right? When he catches the ball with a little bit of space, he's always making the first guy miss and a lot of times making the second guy miss with twitch. That's a rarity. I, I, I can't give him a really good NFL comparison and that's hard to do because there are so many guys but he is different. He is different than any other receiver I've ever evaluated. I'm not saying maybe he doesn't go in the top five, maybe it's not even the top 10, but a team is gonna get a special player and he's gonna show up and he's gonna provide something different than any other receiver on that team. Mel, you went on Quinton Johnson as well as a top receiver or a top receiver, I should say. Yeah, I'm with Jackson Smith and Jigba still. Okay. I, I, my attitude is if I loved him in August, I'm not going to get off of him during a year where he had a hamstring that lingered throughout the entire season. Jackson Smith and Jigba in 2021 was out. Same thing. Oh, it talks about the tape. You know, you go back to 2021. Uh, it doesn't lie. Okay? I always yeah. say the eye in the sky never lies. And the bottom line is in 2021, uh, he lit it up. What he did against Utah was pretty amazing in that Rose Bowl game. Uh, I'm with you on know, Quentin Johnson. If he gets to my Baltimore Ravens, and Lamar Jackson would love to be able to throw it up to Quentin Johnson. He needs sure. that big receiver. Uh, we love to see him there. And, and, of course, Jordan Addison with his ability oh, down the field to make angling. plays vertically. It, Always angling to get that guy to my Ravens. But in terms of Addison from USC, what he did at Pitt with Kenny Pickett, yeah. speaks volumes, he goes out with Caleb Williams, and he does the exact same thing. And then our guy, Todd, I think we both agree, Zay Flowers is going to be a heck of a pick. I put him at the end of the first. Love the kid. Love everything about this guy. Uh, I'm amazed that somebody maybe mid-first wouldn't even jump at him. But if he gets into the late first, early second round, I think Zay Flowers, three to four years from now, we look back and say, why wasn't he the first receiver off the board? Uh, this kid is outstanding. I said his character. Todd talk, talks about character of Will Anderson Jr., Will Levis, and then Bryce Young, and the quarterbacks, and all that. Uh, this guy really gets it. Uh, and I think he's NFL ready. What he did up there at BC speaks volumes about character because he could have left. Jordan Addison left Pitt to go to USC. Others are leaving every day mm -hmm. all over the transfer yeah. portal, right? He didn't leave Boston College. And that team, Todd, that he thought was going to be able to get him the ball. The quarterback, Jerkovic, gets hurt. Now he's transferred. The O line had injuries from August all through the season. And yet, he was out there competing, getting it done. Electric with the ball in his hands after the catch. He can run reverses, jet sweeps. You can do so many things with Zay Flowers. If he's a, Imagine him at Kansas City with Patrick Mahomes. Ooh, 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 ooh. Exactly. 
Exactly. That, that, that's where he belongs. One of those offenses. He's a slot receiver who can do a lot of different things. And, I, and I've told you this before. Jeff Halfley, when I talked to him in August, right before camp, right, right during camp before the season started, he, he, like, he, he couldn't rave enough about this guy. He's like, everyone knows that Zay's getting the ball. We don't have anyone else. We got three offensive linemen that are down. I, I, like, I don't know what we're going to do offensively because I, I just, we just don't have the X's. We, we got the X's and O's, not the Jimmy's and Joe's. But Zay would always be there in the building working as hard or harder than anyone there. And everyone knew when the ball was coming to him, and he still found a way. That's what I love. Like, you got to have a little dog in you as a wide receiver, and he's got that energy and that dog that you look for. He's going to be a great slot receiver in the NFL. He is as explosive as all get. I want to circle back to a couple of these wide receivers just a little bit more, Todd. I'll start with Jackson Smith and Jigba because Mel talked about it. He lit the world on fire in the Rose Bowl a year ago against Utah. Had like whatever it was, 300 and some yards, uh, most ever by any player in a bowl game. Very limited this year because of that hamstring injury. What are the reasons that people aren't more bullish right now on Jackson Smith and Jigba? Coming into the season prior to the injury, talking to scouts, it was like, all right, he, his production was outstanding and what he did was amazing. But maybe it's more system than talent because I don't. where's the explosive trait? Where's the speed? Where's the, the vertical ability? There's drops on tape. So there's all those things. But then you go back and you say, he found a way. So I, I struggle with Jackson Smith and Jigba. I really do because I, I see the talent there. I see the ability to create, but I do think he's going to be a number three receiver. And, and it, every NFL scout I've talked to said, you take a number three early, mid second round. That's not a first round pick. Mel's got him at number five overall. It's fine. We can, we can disagree on that. It's okay, but I, I just, I think there's something missing there, and maybe I'll be, I'll be proven wrong. All right, Mel, let's go to the last one then. Just dive a little bit deeper on Jordan Addison. You mentioned it. He was a great player at Pitt, and then he transferred to USC for his final college season, hooks up with Caleb Williams. And those two, it's, it's a program that obviously is going to continue to be very, very good, but they were kind of the two established stars on that offense specifically. Uh, what, cap what level of prospect would Jordan Addison qualify as in your book? I think if he gets to the Giants, uh, you know, a guy that can get downfield and make plays and give Daniel Jones a guy. He's got a fifth, sixth, seventh round pick he's throwing to in New York right now. Yeah. He's got a number two pick, Mondale Robinson, coming back. But you look at Jordan Addison, like I said, what he did with Kenny Pickett, what he did this year with Caleb Williams, you talk about a guy that can get down the field and make plays. You watch him here with the ball in his hands after the catch, how dynamic he can be as well, run after the catch ability for a guy who, at two different programs, lit it up. Here you see him just blow past the quarterback and make the catch, and then he's gone again. So for Jordan Addison, for the Giants in particular, for the Ravens, you see him here again. This is a guy consistently tied on two different, in two different programs with two different quarterbacks, both of which are outstanding. Kenny Pickett and Caleb Williams. He's playing with two big-time quarterbacks. Yep. And, and, and offense is obviously they're going to design to get him the ball. Think about it. Mark Whipple coordinated that offense for Kenny Pickett to get the ball to Jordan Addison. Now you got Lincoln Riley with Caleb Williams getting the ball to Jordan Addison. But the production was undeniable. And certainly if he's there, and I think he could be possibly there for either the ball to more Ravens or the New York Giants. And I think if he's late in the first round, he's a steal because he is so smooth after the catch. And I know he's not Marvin Harrison, but he's got a lot of those traits where mm. it's just undersized, smooth after the catch and then tracking the deep ball. You know, like that, I see a lot of that in him. By the way, we have to clarify now. You mean Marvin Harrison Sr. Is Marvin Harrison Jr. will be a very big topic correct, correct, during first correct. draft next year. He obviously had an we're, amazing We're getting season. old now. I know. It's crazy. We've got Joey Porter Jr. <laughs> We've got Marvin Harrison Jr. There are a handful of these guys uh, who are making their fathers very proud as NFL stars or future NFL stars. Patrick Fertan II is now like already one of the best cornerbacks in the NFL. That didn't take <laughs> Very long. So wide receivers, we'll dive deeper into that position group throughout the pre-draft process. There are a lot of names that you need to know. Running backs, always interesting to evaluate their value in the draft. And in Todd's most recent top 32 player rankings, just two running backs cracked the top 32 in a Mel's mock at number 26 overall. You broke your own rule, Mel. You put a first-round running back in there. But, <laughs> but 
would Bijan Robinson from Texas I say be nothing. the kind of player that you could potentially break your own rule for if you were an NFL GM and had a first round pick? You never break the rules. No. And you know, you say, I always told Todd, if you're a GM and you sit there and the head coach says, I got to have it. It's in the late first round, like 26 to Dallas, and he's number eight on your big board. Maybe you do. Yeah. Uh, you got to stick to your rules. Why have rules if they're going to be broken? So I would say no. I would say absolutely not. No running backs in the first round. But if there is one to go, this is a mock draft. And yeah. B. John Robinson's going to go in the first round, I believe. I thought Brees Hall could go late first. Look what he did with the Jets. He was a steal, then he got hurt. And then you think about what Kenneth Walker III did with Seattle, okay? The running backs drop. Even though they're first-round caliber, they drop. B. John Robinson is certainly first-round caliber. I think he's top-10 caliber. I think Todd agrees on that. I have him on a big board right now at number eight. But if he's there for Dallas, when you got Powered with the injury, UFA, you think about Zeke. You think about a team that has three Super Bowl rings with Emmett Smith. They've drafted first-round running backs before. They will do it again with the O-line blowing people off the ball and Dak and getting a running back like Bijan. I think for the Dallas Cowboys, it makes sense. I love Dwayne McBride from UAB. Only caught a couple passes, but he's got good hands. He just didn't throw the back out in the backfield. Obviously, Jameer Gibbs, what he can bring to the table with his lightning speed, incredible speed and versatility. Uh, Devon Achain from Texas a and another one, Israel Abanacanda. From Pitt, underrated back, who did a heck of a job for the Panthers up there with Pat Narduzzi. You know, Narduzzi. So for me, this is there's a lot. I go about 22 deep with running backs that I think can play in the NFL. So we talk about the draft not being that strong. Running back, I think, is pretty doggone good this year, and you can get good ones in the fourth through seventh round this year. It's like watching a magician. You know that, like <laughs> sprinkling stuff. Hands are here. Look over here. And then all of a sudden, he just he gets his point through with 15 other players. Bottom line, Bijan Robinson. If you want Saquon Bar- Barkley, Bijan's your guy. Makes you miss most most in the FBS and force miss tackles. Catches the ball out of the backfield. Pass protection and in the building, everyone swears by this guy. The way he works, how just how much of a teammate he is to everybody else. I'm telling you. I, there's exceptions to the rule, Mel, and Bijan is one exception to the rule. Saquon was too. Yeah, Saquon went through a couple years where he was injured, and it happens. It happens to every player. But when you get Saquon at his best, look what happened this year. When you get Bijan at his best, that's what he can be. Man, Cowboys fans would just absolutely have a field day. They took yet another running back in the first round, but a player this special (laughs) at pick 26 would certainly make them a lot better, especially if Tony Pollard is not with the franchise next year. David Copperfield. Well, Tom, let's see you work some of your magic because you have one more running back. Uh, Mel did mention his name, Jameer Gibbs from Alabama. What do you know? Another running back from Alabama who's got a chance to be highly drafted in the NFL. He's a bit different, though, than some of the guys we've seen, the bruisers, the Josh Jacobs, Najee Harris's of the world from Alabama. What do you like about his skill set? Jameer Gibbs, is he's special. He's Alvin Kamara. He's Dalvin Cook. And it's going to be the same thing with both of them, right? Injuries. Can, can they stay healthy? But when they're on the field and they're 100%, they change the game. They catch the ball, they create, they force missed tackles, and they have that second gear. He, Jamar Gibbs was the fastest player on the Alabama team. When I, when I sat down in the meetings and talked to their staff, he had, I forget, it was 23 point something miles per hour. This dude not only is shifty left and right and twitchy and can make the cuts, he is explosive fast, like wide receiver fast. So. I, to me, if you're going to take a running back, that's the, that's the guy you want if you can't get a B. John Robinson, and I would take him late in the first round. Matt, you like him? Yeah, Ty, and, and, and the field, you got to like uh, Jameer Gibbs, and, and he's perfect for the way the game's played now. And uh, the Kamara comparison, I hate mm-hmm. comps, they're, they're ridiculous. But the Kamara comp's been there for a while, Ty. Where did Kamara go? He went in the third round. And he was at Alabama, Tennessee. Jameer Gibbs, Georgia Tech, then Alabama. Uh, he had but, to drop, but if he you redrafted, drop, would, you take, would you take him in the first? Yeah, we could redraft a lot of guys. You're right. He would be certainly one. You would move way up. But you look at the drop, I think it was, it was a Tennessee game. 
The Tennessee game where they would have had chip shot field goal to win the game didn't happen. Uh, so Gibbs had that rare drop there, but he's a really good receiver out of the backfield. When, you know, you know about lightning fast, that's Jameer Gibbs. Uh, certainly this, this, uh, this kid deserves to be, I think, in the second round discussion with Dwayne McBride from UAB uh, and others as well. Uh, but I think the first round is pushing it just a bit. Teams, and Todd, you talk to these teams. Every time I bring up running back, nah, they're gonna, they had been devalued in terms of the first round. There's no question about that. Sorry, that ball rolling about 20 years ago and it's caught on just about with everybody. Uh, B. John Robinson, I think, does go first round. Jameer Gibbs, I think, would be. I almost put him in, but I just couldn't find a team. There's priorities other places. When you know you can get a really good running back, like a Sean Tucker from Syracuse is a good one. You know, uh, Ty J. Spears from Tulane is a really good football player. So there's going to be backs that are going to drop into the fourth, fifth, sixth round that could be as good or better, and maybe the guys go a little bit higher. And you just got to look at the current – I know we always do this, and it's sometimes unfair when we just look at the rosters of the final four teams uh, in the NFL, but you've got sort of all over the place with running back investments, right? Christian McCaffrey was mm -hmm. once, what, the seventh, eighth overall pick in the draft? You've got a guy like Jarek McKinnon who was drafted lower and has bounced around the NFL. He's on a minimum contract for the Chiefs making big contributions. Miles Sanders, second-round pick. Boston Scott, a sixth-round pick, who's with the Saints before he's with the Eagles. Like, there's a lot of evidence that you can find value at running back on day one, day two, day three. Undrafted process, we see it every single year. It's part of the reason why we don't yeah, see How about Isaiah Pacheco, guys. what he's done yeah, with the Kansas City Chiefs as a no seventh-round pick yeah, out of Rutgers. And, uh, yeah, to me, you're right. There's no doubt about it. And Elijah Mitchell, what he did out of Louisiana, Lafayette for the 49ers as a late-round pick a couple years ago. So yeah. uh, the list goes on and on with, with guys that have been outstanding at running back to go on day three of the draft. And I was going to make a point about how quarterbacks can kind of be found, right. usually towards the top of the board. But then Brock Purdy showed up, right? So, like, it's hard to have a conversation about how you have to draft a quarterback early when Brock Purdy hasn't lost a start and currently has the 49ers 60 minutes away from playing for a Super Bowl. Todd, what else did you want to add there? I, ch I cut you off. Nothing, nothing. Okay. I, I was just going to get back into David, David Copperfield and him sprinkling it all over, and that's fine. <laughs> We're My imagine. point is every, po every position you can find someone from the second, third, fourth, fifth round. Sure. If there's an exception to the rule, then you go with it. That's it. Yep. Well, we shall see how high, uh, whether it's Jameer Gibbs or I think probably more likely Bijan Robinson is the first drafted running back. We'll mm -hmm. see how high he goes off the board as we are now just, what, three or so months away from the start of the 2023 NFL Draft. A reminder, if you're watching this live or you catch it early on the podcast feed, 5 o'clock Eastern time on ESPN2, we're going to be doing a full reveal of Mel Kuyper Jr.'s Mock Draft 1.0. It's also available on ESPN+. Plus. Check us out every Wednesday at this time, 1 p.m. Eastern time. Next week, or at least soon, we'll have not just Senior Bowl content, but also a deep dive on that Bears conversation. What would you do if you were sitting in the seat of Ryan Poles with the number one overall pick? Much more to come here on First Draft. For Todd and Mel, I am Field. We'll talk to you guys again 